Our enemies fear the truth. They fear the truth more than anything else. They fear it more than violence. That's why they fear historians, courageous historians, historians who've got guts. And our next speaker has plenty of those. He is the world's most respected historian. He's the world's top expert on World War II. And he's the historian whose works are most used by other historians, but they very rarely mention his name. But someone who did mention his name recently was David Cameron. Cameron. In his, in David Cameron's extremism speech, all about extremists, there was only one extremist he mentioned by name. And that man wasn't a Muslim, wasn't a fundamentalist. That man was David Irving! <laughs> I'm deeply shocked. It was such an ugly bunch. <laughs> the ugliest bunch of extremists. <laughs> Never have I seen so many swastika scars, so many tattoos, so many scarred foreheads, so many swastikas tattooed on the back of your neck. Oh no, that was somewhere else. Those are the, <laughs> the old, the old the file photographs that are dug up time and time again. To, 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 to illustrate the goings on of this kind of extremist club. I'm a bit breathless. I'm at the end of my speaking tour of England. Uh, I've done last night speaking at a historic site, in fact, in Plymouth Hoe. Plymouth Hoe, I, I drove up here this morning. I, I come down from another battlefield, Culloden. I live three miles from Culloden in, in Scotland. Um, that, that's a beautiful place. It's, 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 <clears throat> there's only one, only one it's a white country. It's rather like Plymouth, down in the southwest. That's the, the, the last residue of the, of the English. Yes. I'd like to think of Inverness as being the last residue of the English too, but I dare not say that up there in case I'm, I'm, I'm bludgeoning. <laughs> Culloden was, in fact, the site of the last battlefield on English soil, yeah. in which uh, we, we, we defeated the, the Scots nationalists. <laughs> there she was, out in front, um, wielding mace or whatever they were, they, 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 they doing. Uh, I have to confess, in fact, that I've got no right to speak to her at all. In fact, the only examination I failed was O-level English, uh, O-level history, rather. O-level. <laughs> I, I can just stutter English, but O-level history, uh, O-level takes me back a bit, doesn't it? I, I, I've been saying this. To, to audience after audience around the world, and the, the audience have been looking at me with an increasingly blank faces. What is O level then? <laughs> okay, GCSE, does that mean something? It goes back to G GCSE. I mean, I, I'm sure all the historians have got their, all the conformist historians, as I call them, that's a low level sneer. They, can, they conform. The conformist historians like Ian Kershaw or Anthony Beaver or these people, yeah. <clears throat> they've all got their O-level history, they've all got their GCSE, they, they can remember dates. But I don't read their books, it'd be a waste of time really, because they're just copying each other. And they're re re regurgitating conformist history, which is history written within the comfort zone. We've all, we've all got our own inv individual comfort zones, and I've only recently discovered that these comfort zones extend to history. People have their own comfort zones of history. They, they've got a, history, a version of history which they probably suspect is wrong, but they prefer to live in that comfort zone because they like reading that. They, they like the familiar uh, speeches of Winston Churchill and the other, the other people. Uh, it's, it's their comfort zone, their own individual comfort zones. And that's what these historians, um, that, that's where they're comfortable too. They're comfortable writing that kind of history. This, and they suspect it's wrong, and the people who read it suspect it's wrong. They know that there's a real version out there somewhere, but they're quite happy living in their comfort zone and reading their comfort zone of history. Uh, the Battle of Britain is, is, is a wonderful example about how we defeated the, the, the Nazis. They're called the Nazis, how we defeated them in the Battle of Britain. Um, you don't read about it in Germany, of course, but then my children who all went to the French Lycée in London to in their education, they came and told me that the history teacher was, said that you write rubbish, Teddy. And I said, well, I said, ask your French, ask your French, French history teacher what, what, about the Battle of Waterloo. And it turned out he didn't know anything about the Battle of Waterloo. That was outside his comfort zone. And, and 
So comfort zones have become important for me because I tend to write in a straight line. I write what I find in the records and uh, what the people tell me personally. And that isn't always the same as the comfort zone version of history. Um, I, 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 I'm sure that, that is me. Uh, in Manchester, two or three days ago, somebody said to me, Mr. Irving, you look younger on your YouTube videos than you do now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I, 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 they, they would recognize this. This is me when I used to interview Albert, uh, Albert Speer. Albert Speer, and this is, this is a, well, obviously in our comfort zone there. He's told me something, and I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying his joke. Or oh, I've told him a joke, and he's enjoying mine. I don't know. But, Average fair, he's, he's now dead and gone. Um, he's going to be interviewing Bomber Harris. Bomber Harris, I'm going to say straight away, was, was and is still my hero. A great British commander. White, he came from South Africa, from Rhodesia, originally where he was born. He died in England. Uh, maligned by, <coughs> by Churchill. Um, his, his force of brave airmen had given no campaign medal, and uh, he himself, no peerage, he was given none of the traditional awards for a great commander, <coughs> Bomber Harris. I interviewed, him, I interviewed him in 1961, that was 52 years ago, 53 years ago. Hmm? There's a statue outside St. Clement Day, in the, in the Strand. It was what? There's a statue. Yes, right. Since then, there have been statues erected to him. There won't be any statues erected to me. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> One day there will. Uh, but but uh, it's true. There's a statue erected to him outside St. Martin's and uh, St. Bride's uh, in Sweet Street. And I occasionally go past that on my way to the law courts. <laughs> and, and, and we may yet meet Mr. Cameron there also, where he, he actually describes me as the Holocaust and now David Irving. He's really treading on thin ice with that. And I'm going to study that when I go back to Scotland and see what can be done. I've got a, I've got a year to think about it and make him sweat. Um, it makes me wonder who, who actually put him up to it. Who, who, puts, who puts Cameron up to these things? Um, it's a liberal. <laughs> Is a liberal metropolitan elite advisor. Liberal metropolitan, yes. Elite, elite advisor. Mm. I'd like to I mean, at the, at, the end, at the end of the war, Churchill actually wrote this about Obama Harris. He said, it came to me that the... Yeah, um, that, it seems to me that the, the moment has come March 28, <coughs> March 28, 1945. It seems to me the moment has come when the question of bombing of German cities simply for the sake of increasing the terror. That's an admission, though under other pretexts. And since when has our government been doing things under pretexts? <laughs> so under other pretexts should be reviewed, otherwise we shall come into control of an utterly ruined land. We shall not, for instance, be able to get any housing materials out of Germany, for our own needs because some temporary provision had to be made for the Germans themselves. The destruction of Dresden remains a serious query against the conduct of Allied bombing. That's Churchill trying to window dress in the last month of the war, trying to create archive documents that he can then fish out of the archives and print in his volume uh, of, of multi-volume history, which he then intended to, 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 to write. He wrote that on March 28th and he sent it to his chief of air staff and the chief of air staff sent it back saying, we're not going to accept this from you, Mr. Churchill, because you know who was to blame for the bombing of Dresden. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Churchill then eventually had to sit down and write a much more different, balanced version. That's the way these things were done with Churchill. He was, he was uh, appointed March, May the 10th, 1940, which is a, a story of all, all of itself. He, he was appointed as a result of one of his own fiascos, a Norwegian fiasco, the invasion of Norway, which he had plotted ever since March 1940. He had, he had, he had plotted with the French to invade Norway as on the pretext of coming to the assistance of Finland, which is under the Soviet Union attack, which has nearly got us into war with the Soviet Union back in 1940, and which would have been a monumental blunder to him, but, but Churchill had uh, just decided to attack, and he he went to France to for a session of the Supreme War Council, and 
That's where the decision was taken to come to the aid of Finland, which means landing forces, French and British forces in, in Norway. Before going back to England, Churchill then made a telephone call to the Prime Minister of Finland, uh, to Foreign Minister actually, Harry Holmer, to tell him what had been decided at the Supreme War Council in March 1940. And in his naivety, Churchill didn't realize that the telephone lines from Paris to Helsinki would go across German territory, German right territory. <laughs> and that the Germans would be so indecent as to pick up their, their own telephone tapping agency and, and they would f f tap the conversation. So Churchill actually gave Hitler the, the occasion he needed, the pretext he needed for the invasion, his, his own invasion of Norway, and Hitler got in there first. He got there with the fastest with the most, as the Americans say. He got there a few hours before the British. Uh, the, Ameri the, the German invasion was brilliantly successful. He offered a substantial number of German warships in doing so, but as, as Hitler said, if the German if Navy achieves nothing more in this, this entire war than the, than the success in Finland and in, in, in Norway than they've done there, they've served their purpose. And he also commented in private to friends, this is an example of Churchill's journalistic desire to spill the beans. There were journalists always wants to be the first to reveal what happened. And, so, and the result, uh, Churchill, th Churchill then went ahead with his own invasion of Norway. He put the guns on one warship, he put the cr crews on another, he put the gun, gun crews on another warship, he put the ammunition on a third warship, and he landed them on three separate beaches. Uh, the, the invasion of Norway was a total fiasco. And uh, one month later, the entire British expeditionary force had to withdraw from Norway uh, with his tail between his legs, and Churchill became the Prime Minister because he put the blame on Neville Chamberlain. Ah. Mm -hmm. Neville Chamberlain should be our hero. He's the, he's the Prime Minister. Yes, he's the Prime Minister. Yes. The, the newspapers are rather kind of boosting Winston Churchill legend, uh, but Neville Chamberlain was the hero, and uh, but Churchill said, I'm, I think that it's a sad thing about Neville Chamberlain. The history will be very harsh on Neville Chamberlain, and I'm afraid because I know that, because I'm going to be writing the history. <laughs> And he did, and it was. That's why everyone now is taught that Neville Chamberlain, well, I mean, no language is too, too, too bad to, to condemn the man of it. But Churchill, once in office, uh, he was facing a problem because in his cabinet, he had three members of the cabinet who wanted peace. That was Neville Chamberlain and Lord Beaverbrook, the owner then of the Sunday Express, uh, and Lord Halifax, who was the foreign secretary. They all wanted peace. Churchill wanted war. He was a warmonger. He had been boosted into the cabinet on the back of Jewish money, which, which had kept him going through the years of wilderness. And how to defeat this peace movement? Well, if he could persuade the Germans to start bombing London, that would kill off the peace movement. But the Germans weren't going to do it. He later began to realize that Hitler had embargoed the bombing of London. Hitler had allowed the bombing of, of seaports to begin, and dockyards, and oil refineries. He allowed all this other bombing activity to begin, but London itself was uh, totally invulnerable, not to be attacked by the German Air Force. Hitler knew this on code breaking, and he did what he could to persuade Hitler to bomb Londoners. <coughs> well, you don't realize this, you're not taught this by the history books, but it, it is Winston Churchill at work. Uh, he, he, his great ambition was to see London in, London in flames, to see Londoners being bombed and killed, his own Londoners. He didn't mind because he didn't intend staying in London when the bombing began. In fact, he was never in London when the bombing began. He knew 85% of the time when <laughs> London was going to be a target. When, when, the, when the bombing offensive began, um, he had three means of learning what the target was. One of them was the enigma. Do, do I have the enigma machine? Probably not. <laughs> He, the enigma machine was this. But thanks to this machine, we knew what the Germans were doing. In June 1940, we, we cracked the uh, German Air Force operational code. This machine, the Germans would type in. In, in James Bond movies, the very, one of the very early James Bond movies, James Bond is, is looking for a Russian enigma machine or a Russian code machine, which is like this, a little typewriter. And uh, at that time, we knew nothing about enigma, or so it's supposed to. But you type into this and it brings out just code messages and we type in the code messages at the other end in the same machine and it, and it reproduces it in perfect German. 
and it's got little wheels at the back, these, these three or four or five rotors at the back. If you had five rotors in the, in the code machine, that produced an absolutely invulnerable code. Millions and million, million, billions of permutations and com combinations uh, in producing it. You, you, we worked out that you couldn't crack that code. It would take the human brain millions of years just to work on one code for one day. That's when the British came along and said, well, it'll take the human brain that long, but it won't take a machine that long. As that's when they secretly started sitting down and devising a computer. There were no computers in the world, but the British devised a computer back in 1939 that would crack this code. And it was devised by post office telephone engineers based at the Telephone Research Centre at Dollis, Dollis Hill in North London. I remember writing to them when I first began to suspect, suspect this and said, I've heard rumours that you were working on a, a machine that would crack codes and can you put me in touch with the scientists involved in this? And I got no reply. Strange, strange, no, nobody replied to me. Um, the letter must have found its way somewhere to it. Because simultaneously, this is about 1963, 1964, I was writing a book called The Mare's Nest. And there was a door, a ring on my doorbell and a, a man standing outside very small ex-REF sergeant. My name is Sergeant Harcourt. Can I come in? I've got to tell you something. The government's been deceiving us all. This. It's a terrific secret. They know that these, we've been decoding all the German codes, all the war. We've been t doing this. We've not been telling anyone, and no one knows this. It's the biggest secret, and it's kept on secret, and can I come and tell you all this? So I said, my dear fellow, do come in. This is Paddington. I lived in Paddington in those days. <clears throat> do come in, and I sat him down on my sofa, and I let him spill the beans, and he told me the whole story about the workings of Bletchley Park, which nobody knew about, and GCHQ, which nobody knew about. And I invited him in, and he authenticated himself. He produced a, a telegram showing, um, it was dated 1st of September 1939, the actual telegram he'd received from the GPO saying, yeah, Dear Mr. Harcourt, you're, you have been called up, you will be posted to a, a new job concerned with your language, your German specialist. Uh, he assumed it was going to be decoding letters, uh, censoring letters, but no. He said, they, they took me into Bletchley Park and they, they, they shut me away in Bletchley Park and I wasn't let out until the end of the war. Right. That makes sense. Um, that was the first clue that I had that we were reading messages, or perhaps the second clue. If you've read enough of the German messages, if you've read enough, as I did, if you've read enough of the English uh, cabinet level correspondence, then you began to suspect there was a correlation between the truth. You couldn't quite put your finger on it, but uh, Lord Charles, Lord Charles was Churchill's advisor, his personal scientific advisor. We'll meet him a bit in the story because he's one of the, the brains behind the saturation bombing offensive, offensive. Lord Charles, his real name is Professor Friedrich Lindemann. He wasn't Jewish, wasn't even German. He was born in Metz and he just happened to be, uh, like, came from that side of the world and he um, was Churchill's advisor and his permanent, his advisor on just about everything, his go-between on numbers and economics and the, the British economy and the atomic bomb. He, he knew a great deal. He, he's somebody I would like to meet. I know he's dead. He'd been dead since about 1960. But one day I would like eventually to go, go down. Go down. I'm going to be upstairs, of course. But he, I'd like to go down and have a quick word with him <laughs> and, and ask, ask what life was like under, under Churchill. And he's one of these stories, people are to whom they're endless stories. Switch that phone off, that phone is bothering. It is, it, Churchill would say, Prof, uh, um, as, a, as a quaffed champagne, champagne has to be quaffed, quaffed, Q-U-A-F-F-E-D, uh, as a quaffed champagne together, he would, Churchill would say, Prof, how much champagne have we drunk? And if this bottle was tipped out into this room here, uh, how, and all the bottles that I've drunk since the beginning of this war were tipped into this room here, how, would, how high up the wall would the, the level rise? And out would come the Prof's slide rule. I see blank faces, slide rule. <laughs> Out would come across. Well, Rudolf has had a cylindrical slide rule. When he landed in Scotland, he was that clever. He, he actually had a cylindrical slide rule to tell about his, his navigation. He used it for navigation. Also would come the prof slide rule, and he would say after a while, it wouldn't come very far. Winston, it's only about uh, two or three feet. That was that kind of man, uh, the prof. Biography of him written by Roy Harrod. A good historian back in the 1950s, he published a book called The Prof. 
And that's where I found out about him. And I read the book, and I read the beginning of the book. It said, I'm indebted to Nuffield College in Oxford for access to Lord Charles' papers. Oh. I took, a, I took my car straight down to Oxford, and I went to see the library at Nuffield College. And can I see the Lord Charles' papers? I understand you have them here. And he brought out a bunch of keys and jangled them. He said, well, Mr. Irving, yes, you were very just, didn't uh, these, here, here, I tell you what, they're down in the basement. Open the cupboard and you'll, you'll see there's three or four steel cupboards there. That's Lord Charles' papers. We close at five and turn out the lights. Amazing. I just went down in the basement and read these bit files and cabinet minutes, bound volumes of cabinet minutes, bound volumes of defense committee minutes, bound volumes of chiefs of staff committee minutes. I mean, it's, it's like Aladdin's cave, only that word doesn't describe it. I just checked into a local hotel. I dictated three million words, a, 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 two, a quarter million words in the first three days. Uh, the, the Morgenthau Plan, my book on our back, uh, there it is, the ring binder, the Morgenthau Plan. The actual plan was contained in that 30 pages long. Two Barrois, two Barrois, more blank faces. Two Barrois was the Manhattan Project, the, the British Atomic Bomb Project. Back in the 1930s, 1940s, we invented the atom bomb. We gave that secret to the Americans. All these things in Lord Charles' papers, because of his wide interests, his fingers touched everywhere. And then there were these strange messages, strange evidence that he knew about German signals that were being transmitted just one or two days earlier, which began to occur to me. Well, obviously, he's got some kind of code breaking, and it's not natural. We're breaking codes. We were reading the German signals. It didn't occur to me as so, so important at that time. So I put it in my book. I, I wrote a chapter called Enigma. Enigma, the Enigma machine wrote a chapter called Enigma and how the British had, these, these geniuses had cracked the code and they'd got the, the, they, they were using it and they shortened the war by several years. Put it in my book, on, it's called The Mare's Nest. One copy on the back there. Not yet sold. One copy. <laughs> uh, you'll find that actual chapter is contained in the book because it was not in the book as published in 1964. I was raided by three gentlemen in, in, in Burberry uh, raincoats uh, who arrived at my doorstep and just confiscated the chapter. And simultaneously, the publishers were raided, and the book was chapter, the chapter it was confiscated from them. And, they, and I was invited round to the cabinet office historical section. Uh, all these people were sitting around the table. The gentlemen who actually write our histories and uh, in informed me that, Mr. Irving, you do appreciate that we're not going to be revealing the story of Enigma for several years yet. It's an absolutely top secret in Britain. I said, what do you mean? It's 1964. How long has the war been over? This is Britain's great achievement. We had not invented not just centimetric radar and, and the atom bomb and penicillin and all these wonderful achievements, but we invented the computer, electromechanical and following that, the fully electrical computer. and. Why can't we boast about it? Oh, well, it's a bit of an embarrassment, really, but uh, you've got to ap appreciate that. I mean, I wonder what his name was, this man. I could see, I, actually, I went, as I left the cabinet office historical section, I, I, had, I was indecent enough to go and look in the reg re registration book to see who had signed in before me, and it was Jeffrey Evans. <coughs> Jeffrey Evans, GCHQ, security officer. GCHQ, now people know what those are, but in those days, that GCHQ was one of those things forbidden by the D notice. I'm not allowed to mention the actual acronym it, that, that it existed, even now, and now people talk about it, but in those days, it didn't. He said, Mr. Evans, you do, you do appreciate that we've actually, when the war was over, we rounded up all the Enigma machines and polished them and oiled them and, uh, and uh, overhauled them, and we've been selling them to the third world assuring them that no one can possibly read the code messages. <laughs> and I rather like that. I mean, the idea that, we, that there were large numbers of little darkies who were plotting the overthrow of the British Empire, which I was a great believer in. They were plotting the overthrow of the British Empire, and, and that they'd been assured that we couldn't possibly read their messages as long as they sent them in this code machine, Enigma, and we'd made them pay for it. I liked it. And uh, but that wasn't the real reason. I've been sold a bit of goods. He also said, uh, Miss Irving, um, we, we appeal to you as your sense of honour as a, as, a uh, as a British gentleman, which is really low. Of, I mean, it didn't work with me, but I mean, <laughs> it's about as low as you can think. Um, 
In fact, R.V. Jones, who was the British chief of British scientific intelligence at that time, he, he asked me once as I was driving up to London Airport, he, he actually writes about it in his memoirs. I asked Irving why he hadn't revealed this 20 years later, because this was a major international scoop that he had that he had not revealed it. And uh, I, I drove him out to London Airport. I, and I had I'd, I'd got the journey from Mayfair to London Airport down to nine minutes in those in those years. I, I knew exactly the, which lanes to take and so on, and what speeds to drive at. In, in, in my roles, which I had in those days, and it was, I got it down to nine minutes, which he actually mentions in his in his memoirs. And he also mentions my reply why I hadn't revealed the scoop. And I said, I'm, I, patriotic uh, patriotism. Well, it's a nice answer, and it, I, I like it. I'll, I'll accept that. It's not the reason, I mean, the real reason was because in, in years later I discovered in the chief, Combined Chiefs of Staff files, which is the papers of uh, General, mm -hmm. the names escape me, the Chief of the, the, chief, the, chief of the General Staff in, in America, um, Combined Chiefs of Staff, which was the Joint American, Joint Chiefs of Staff and British Chiefs of Staff meeting in Washington, a small subcommittee. In September 1945, they had decided that no one would ever be allowed to reveal the secret of the enigma. And the reason was, they said, because if, and no one, not official historians, not writers, not people who had stumbled across the truth somehow by comparing German signals with British messages, subsequently, no one would be allowed to reveal this. And the reason given by the, uh, George Marshall was his name, uh, the reason given by George Marshall was that if the Germans ever found out that we had been reading their signals, they would have grounds for s saying that we had defeated them unfairly. And it would be, it would be the origins of a new uh, stab in the back legend that they could, they could fall back on, so to speak. Well, yes, but I mean, um, which is why you will find these multi-volume histories of British official history the war at sea, uh, the, the strategic bombing offensive against Germany, all these official histories. They don't mention Enigma, they don't mention code breaking. The war was won without it. But that was the most significant ele element, to my mind, in the breaking of the, the, the war. Uh, the first history to mention it was the, the actual history written by Professor Hinsley, the, the, the history of the British Secret Service. I just mention that because Enigma plays a part in the story I'm going to be telling you today. The Enigma was one reason, one way in which we knew what city was going to be bombed in 85% in of the time we had a pretty good idea. The Germans would come over and bomb us. We'd like to know what city was going to be bombed by the, by the Germans. The Germans would have the decency to radio a few days ahead saying uh, the entire Air Force or Luftwaffe or Luftwaffe or whatever it was is going to bomb such and such a target. And sometimes it wasn't actually a, a plain language. Sometimes the Germans kind of used sneaky language. They would say, um, the Luftwaffe 4 is going to be bombing Umbrella. Well, that's obviously Birmingham. OK, wrong generation. If I said Umbrella, then the, then the older generation would have said, oh, yes, that's Neville Chamberlain, because he was the, that was, Umbrella was his trademark, and Neville Chamberlain, was the, that was his constituency. So Umbrella meant Birmingham, and the Germans knew that. There were other cities, uh, but, but basically it was code breaking was one means that we knew. There were two other means. There, were, there was the radio beam. The Germans had radio beams. They switched on uh, on the transmitters in Belgium or, or, or Holland or France across with one single radio beam across a German city, which would intersect with another radio beam exactly over the aiming point. Uh, that was called Knickerbein in this original version, and then a subsequent version devised by the Germans is called Excarate, and the British knew this, and they said, well, for heaven's sake, why do you want radio beams for going on bombing a, bombing a target for? We've done it perfectly accessibly in, in Britain all this time. The British Air Force is capable of seeing in the dark. They eat plates and plates of carrots, <laughs> which, which gives the British, yes, that takes you back a bit, doesn't it? And, uh, and therefore the British can see in the dark and they don't need the, the target finding stuff. But the Germans apparently didn't have enough carrots. They were using radio beams, which they had spent a lot of money devising. And these beams were then intersected over Regent's Park, for example, would be a t typical target area, Regent's Park, the target area where the German beams intersected. And because the Germans wanted to be absolutely certain, they would switch on the radio beams sometime during the day to, to get, the, in, get them into practice. 
they would play around with them until they were intersecting over the, over the target area and they would send a plane out to scout and, and sniff and say, yes, the beams, yes, they're intersecting over Regent's Park, so they've got them right today. And they would also send out a plane uh, during the afternoon to, to sniff the actual weather. Because when you think about it, the Germans had another disadvantage, not just that they didn't know about Enigma, but the other disadvantage was they, did, they didn't have the weather. They didn't have British weather. We, we knew what the weather was. It was going to be drifting from west to east across the uh, English countryside and across Europe. So we always knew slightly better than they did what the weather was going to be. And they wanted to know what the weather was going to be over Manchester or Birmingham or whatever target they had for the, for the day. And what way, better way than finding out they would send over a plane early on to see what the weather was doing over Manchester or Birmingham. And we would intercept the messages that that plane relayed back to, to, to Berlin. So the code breaking is quite important. I mention this because um, Coventry. Coventry. Churchill actually, if you look in my, my Churchill book, the, the, the lucky people here who actually bought a copy of this book, you'll see that in, in, in this, at the beginning of the book, there's, there's a page of a diary. It's uh, different. And it's, it's a, that's Churchill's desk calendar. I've got all his desk calendars. He kept it throughout the war. It was, it was stolen by his uh, bodyguard, Tommy Thompson. Scotland Yard bodyguard, Tommy Thompson. Scotland Yard had a bad reputation in those days. And uh, Tommy Thompson would come and steal these things. It, after the final days of the war, he sold the whole bunch of Churchill's desk calendars. And his son, his godson, came to visit me one day in Paddington and said, Mr. Irving, I've got all Churchill's desk calendars here. I want a half million pounds for them. Can you afford that? No. I said, I'm not going to exercise them. They're hot. Hot, H-O-T. Therefore, <clears throat> it, it's not a good idea for me to buy something hot for half a million pounds as the Treasury solicitor or someone will come around and claim his government property the very next day. Yes, so I said, I, I will have her rent them from me for 5,000 pounds. I rented the Churchill desk calendars for 5,000 pounds from this uh, young man for one year. <clears throat> a lot of money in those days, 1980. And they're kind of marginally useful, except for when you get to important events like Coventry. At the beginning of November, uh, the, the Air Ministry had contacted Churchill and said, well, we've intercepted a message from the German Air Force, uh, German Air Force saying that they're going to be bombing a, 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 a British target for three successive nights. The entire German Air Force is going to take part in this Grand Slam under the code name Moonlight Sonata. Moonlight Sonata, Mondstein Sonata. <clears throat> and we don't know what the target's going to be, unfortunately. The, we don't know the primary target, but it's going to, the secondary target is going to be out of London, and the tertiary target is going to be the home counties, so, well, it stands to reason that the primary target is going to be central London for three days until it's wiped out by the entire German Air Force. Driver, take me to Oxfordshire, says Churchill. Now, Churchill at Oxford, it wasn't just any Oxfordshire. Churchill had a friend called Ronald Tree, who was a Conservative member of Parliament and a multimillionaire, who had a big estate called Ditchley, D-Y-T-C-H-L-E-Y, not even D-I-T-C-H. I mean, they tried to change the spelling in modern histories, but it's actually spelled with a Y. I mean, you know it and I know it. It's that kind of place, Ditchley. And Churchill used to go out there when, when, whenever the air raids came. When, whenever he knew that London was going to be bombed, he was clever and he went out and, and uh, resided with Ronald Tree. I knew his wife, knew Ronald Tree's wife. She lives in, in New York and when they interviewed her, got a lot of stories from her. And then when he, the raid was over, the following morning, he would put on his Air Commodore's uniform. There it is here, in this very nice sketch of Churchill. I don't know what rationality he had for wearing an Air Commodore's uniform, but he put on the Air Commodore's uniform and he would go around the east end of London. And they would say, good old Winnie, wave little flags. Good old Winnie, uh, we can take it. We can take it according to news sources. And um, gradually the legend was built up. So that, that, in November 1940, he, the actual appointment cards, which I had, showed Churchill doing something very odd. November the 14th, the first moonlight night, <coughs> there he is, he takes his appointment card and he draws a, a bracket over the three days, November the 14th, 15th and 16th, with, and he rubs out all his appointments for those three days in, in Downing Street. 
except until four o'clock on November the 14th. He has, you know, I think it's um, Hugh Dalton as a minister in the Ministry of Economic Warfare. And Hugh, Hugh Dalton writes in his own diary that Churchill kind of <clears throat> became very quick towards the, the end of the, the, the period and he looks at his watch and it's, it's time to leave. And he actually goes down the garden and gets into the, goes through the garden gate at the foot of the garden in the brick wall. It's still there in Downing Street. In, David, in case David Cameron needs to do the same thing one day, in case we go after him. <laughs> there's, there's this, this gate, garden gate, set in the brick wall at the foot of the garden, and beyond that is, is, is Churchill in, uh, Churchill's Daimler motor car. The driver takes me out to Ditchley at four o'clock in the afternoon on November the 14th. Of course, he thinks there's going to be an air raid on London. And as the car is going down past Hyde Park, in fact, it's going up, up past Hyde Park and it's overtaken by a dis dispatch rider from, from the Air Ministry, a motorcycle rider who has a letter through the window to the Prime Minister. And, and it's a, a pretty dim uh, uh, he, he, Churchill's private secretary, John Martin, is sitting next to him that, at that moment. He says, oh, I've just received this, dim, this very grim letter from the Air Ministry. Uh, it says that uh, there's going to be a very heavy air raid on London tonight, tonight for the next three nights. And it would not be right for me to let the citizens of this fine uh, establishment, this fine metropolis, to suffer the trials and tribulations of a gigantic air raid without my being in their midst. And he drives back to number 10 Downing Street. That's not actually what the letter said, although John Martin has told that. In, uh, the letter is actually in the files, and it says, Prime Minister, we've discovered now that the Germans have switched on their blind bombing beams, and the target area is going to be Coventry, not London, after all. And we assist, uh, they, they sent over their spotter plane and they sent over their uh, weather reconnaissance and it's quite definitely tonight the target is going to be Coventry. And so a massive air raid on Coventry takes place and 390 people are killed. The Coventry, of course, can't be told because that would violate, uh, would vitiate the, the secret of the Enigma machine. That's the true story of Coventry and how, how the Coventry aid happened. But Churchill didn't. Didn't, stop, didn't let facts in, introduce with a fine story when we came to, came to write all this up in his memoirs. You won't find any of this in his memoirs. It's in the records of the day, uh, which, which I've got. But he, he was, I mean, whenever he would write about the bombing war, um, he, he, he writes about Guernica, and he writes about Rotterdam, and he writes about Warsaw, and he writes about uh, uh, Coventry. Guernica, in the Spanish Civil War, 1937, bombed by the German, German Air Force. Three German planes actually carried out the raid. I know that because I've investigated this in some detail. And I went to Guernica many years ago and actually spoke to the mayor of the city. And, and he showed me the city records and he showed me the newspapers of the local city. And it uh, shows that uh, the actual air raid casualties were, were such that the, the newspaper the next day actually printed a list of those who had been injured in the raid. But not actually any, any people had been killed. There, there were a few people killed in the raid on Guernica. It, it killed 97 people actually. Although nowadays you read thousands of people were killed in this air raid. Churchill said that. Same in Rotterdam. Four days after the beginning of the Hitler's offensive against the Western country, Holland had surrendered. 14th of September, 14th of May 1940. Uh, the Germans were in the midst of an air raid on Rotterdam at that moment. The, the planes had already been scrambled and sent off to, to bomb an artillery unit in, in Rotterdam. An entire uh, a squadron of Heinkel, one on one planes. Uh, the message to abort did not reach all the, uh, all the flights. One flight carried out the raid and, and the margarine factory was bombed and regrettably about 900 people were killed. Uh, when the oil flooded out of the margarine factory and set all the surrounding houses on fire. 900 people. Churchill says 30,000 people were killed in the raid on horror on and so on. He, he does this in all, because later on he's going to justify what he did in his bombing bombing campaign. He was in uh, difficulties because he had the peace movement uh, growing stronger. There were demonstrations outside number 10 Downing Street. In those days you could walk down the high street, you could walk down Downing Street. Margaret Thatcher hadn't erected the iron railings, iron railings that they have now there, the, the gates. Uh, the, 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 you could walk down there with your, 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 your friends and stand outside number 10 Downing Street and shout at the windows. And uh, Churchill 
was anxious to get, to get rid of that. <coughs> he also wanted the bombing of his, his he wanted the bombing of London to begin so that he could tell Roosevelt, his friend, uh, about how, how wicked the Germans were doing this kind of thing. And Hitler wouldn't do him a favour. Hitler wouldn't bomb London. We have the impression now, of course, that the bombing of London carried on for a whole year. Right, in fact, the whole war, and from the first moment until the last moment, uh, the vicious bombing of London went on. Churchill had warned the cabinet, warned the government before, before the war even broke out that 50,000 Londoners would die in the first week of the war from German bombing. And yet the war was now one year old, and not a single bomb had fallen on London. Nobody had died. General de Gaulle writes in his memoir saying, um, he writes in his memoir saying, I visited Churchill at number 10 Downing Street and I found him on the back lawn shaking his fist at the sky saying, why won't you come? Why won't you come? That's because he's dealing with Hitler and Hitler had ordered there was to be no bombing. All that changed on August 24th, 1940. On August 24th, 1940, one German plane lost its way flying up the Thames, missed rather highs. It had orders to bomb a, 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 a refinery in, in rather highs and dropped its bombs on the east end of London. Nobody was hurt, but the damage was there. And Hitler had, uh, and, and, and Churchill had the excuse that he now, the pretext that he, pretext again, there it is, you see. He had the pretext he needed to start the bombing campaign. Uh, August the 24th, August the 25th, I've, I've checked the, the War Diary of Bomber Command. The War Diary of Bomber Command is now in the public record office. Anyone can go and see it, and they're at 9.15 a.m. that morning. Churchill telephones had the Commander-in-Chief of Bomber Command, Air Marshal Sir Robert Pierce, I think was his name, not Harris, Pierce, and, and said, I want 100 bombers minimum sent to Berlin tonight. No decision of the Chiefs of Staff, only just Churchill himself. I want 100 bombers sent to Berlin tonight. Now, 8 August is not a good time for bombing Berlin. It's, it's, uh, the, the, the nights are too short. You, the nights have to be longer to enable the planes to get out and, and back in, in the hours of darkness. <clears throat> and Pierce told him that. And they, Pierce also said, you do realize that if we do that, that's inviting retaliation from Hitler. And Churchill just twinkled. The retaliation was just what he wanted. He wanted to see Londoners die so that he could then point to these dead Londoners as being, uh, being reason. Remember that August the 26th, August the 27th, uh, the British went out and bombed Berlin. Very few bombs actually fell on Berlin. A few bombs did fall there because they got by accident, more than by, by design. And on September the 4th, Adolf Hitler made a famous speech saying when this drunkard, uh, this madman in London, carries on these attacks, um, he, he's got to realize we're not going to uh, retaliate just with, with small measures. Uh, if, he, if he drops a hundred bombs, then we'll drop a thousand. If he drops a hundred kilograms of bombs, then we'll drop a thousand kilograms of bombs on, on London. That's Hitler and the sport palace. And these are just the words that Hitler had been waiting for, that, just the words from Hitler that Churchill had been waiting for. September the 5th, he orders a mass air raid on, on, on Berlin. On September the 6th, on a Saturday, I think it is, uh, we, we, we stand in the streets listening to the sound of the entire German air force coming up the Thames. And the, the area they carry out that afternoon on, in broad daylight kills 3,000 Londoners. Now Churchill has what he wants, but you won't see it this way in, in his book. You can piece it together. Yeah, this is his, uh, the, the multi-volume history written by Sir Winston Churchill. You can piece it together, but you'll only find all these details if you go to the archives and you actually see the, de the f details of the phone conversations and the rest. <clears throat> and that, from that moment on, there was no, no looking back. The war then progressed from one stage to the next. Uh, we, we, had, we, we, we had found out in, in 1941 that the Air Force wasn't capable of doing any real damage. A, a judicial commission of inquiry had found this out. Mr. Justice Singleton had carried out an in investigation and had established that the bomber command couldn't see what was hitting. It was as simple as that. Sir Robert Thornby, who was the uh, rather nice uh, deputy commander of bomber command, I, I knew him. I went to see him once. He had butterflies. He had butterfly collection around his wall. All these uh, butterflies pinned to the wall. <coughs> He said, I used to speak to the airmen after they returned from these flights. And I would say what they'd been doing, what did you do the night before last or the night before that? And they said, oh, we went over to Cologne or we went to some other city and we, 
we dropped uh, seven tons, I dropped seven tons of bombs from my, my aircraft. And I said to that airman, says Robert, this saw, Robert Swanby says to me, he says, I said, you didn't drop seven tons of bombs on Cologne. You've exported seven tons of bombs from England, that is true. But we don't know where they fell. You got, if you're lucky, they would have fallen in Germany. But more than that, we can't be, say, be, be saying with certain, certainty. He's a great man. I mean, he just needed clear, pragmatic thinking like that to sort out the mystery. Bomber Command, you, over a period of, of stages, then gradually improved its act. They started off with a navigation device called G, which laid a lattice, a radio lattice, over Europe as far as it could. It followed through with Obo, which is a, a piece of equipment they installed in mosquitoes, which the Pathfinder Force then operated. It followed then with uh, uh, GH, which was an improved version of G. And finally, it had H2S. H2S was an airborne radar, which was issued to the main force bombers. Uh, the main force then would be equi equipped with uh, a radar set that they could look down and they could see effectively a representation of the countryside they were passing over on the screen in front of them. Far ahead of anything, anything that the Germans had, but it was it was a, it was a move movement. You could gradually aim to concentrate the the attack. Uh, the question of what was going to be attacked was very interesting. It was actually Lord Charwell who who, de who devised this. He said that uh, a Lancaster bomb was going to drop uh, in its lifetime. <coughs> he said it, it, a Lancaster bomb was going to, in fact. I have about 60 or 70 sorties in its lifetime before it puts its wheels up, it gets shot down. And in 60 or 70 sorties, the Lancaster bomb is going to drop seven tons of bomb each sortie, something like that, and each bomb is going to, each ton of bombs is going to kill about one, one German civilian. So we can work out how many Germans we can kill with what we've got. And that's what he actually wrote in a, in a mem memorandum in February 1942. The Lancaster, it has to be said, was a spectacular plane. I think it's two still flying even now. I think one's built in, in Canada and one's built in England, and it, it's Rolls Royce, four Rolls Royce Merlin engines. When they're properly tuned, it produces an unmistakable note. Uh, and when the, the, Her Majesty has a fly past down the road in Buckingham Palace, I used to live out in Mayfair and I would lean out of the window with my arm so you could actually see the brief glimpse of, of the, the Lancaster flying past, heralded by the, this note of the. The plane flying out of the land. a beautiful plane. Could have been put to a better, paper, better purpose. But it was, I think it was one of the most beautiful planes produced by the Air Force. But Lord Charles' memorandum of 1942 lay on Ch Harris's desk when he took over the office in, in 1942. And uh, the, the aim basically was, he said, that uh, you're going to upset German workers far more by destroying their houses. A German worker is going to be more upset by the destruction of his house than by, this, by the, the killing of close relatives or near neighbours or by the destruction of his factory. So he will have to destroy as much German workers' housing as possible. And that's what the memorandum said. I mean, to me, it looks like a war crime now. In, in modern terms, it will be a war crime. It definitely would be under, under the new Geneva laws that have been passed since then. This kind of thing is a war crime. And I, I suppose. To my simple mind, it, was, it should have been a war crime even then. But Harris implemented it. He took, took this over and he set to work operating Bomber Command the way that this new memorandum said. And I, I, knew, I knew a lot of the airmen who, who did these raids. And nothing I'm saying today should be taken as disparaging the, the memory of these airmen. They were brave men. You had to be a brave man to fly a seven-ton load of explosive into an enemy country and have... have uh, the ground defence is firing at you. <coughs> and the, I, I knew a lot of them. There was one crew lived in Leicester, I remember very clearly. At that time, Leicester was, was all white. And now, of course, it's not. But this was uh, um, the, 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 um, the, the, these crews, uh, Lancaster was crewed by seven or eight very fine young men, mostly young, mostly in their twenties, mostly without families. Uh, very few of them came back. Bomber Harris was a ruthless commander. He was, he was greatly admired by his, his men. <coughs> he very seldom met them. He would issue orders from on high and they would fly. Very few survived more than 30, 30 missions. A tour of duty meant flying 30 missions into the jaws of hell. <coughs> and if the loss rate went above 8 or 9% per day, then they knew their chances of surviving an entire tour were almost non-existent, and yet they still flew. 
we, very few of them, any of them who had moral compunctions about what they were doing, and quite a few did, then found that their log books had been stamped LMF, lack of moral fiber, which very few people wanted to have. It was a rather nasty trick. It was a way of, first of all, they, they hadn't volunteered for bomber command because they knew what it was going to mean. They volunteered for fighter command or coastal command, but they found themselves posted to bomber command and they didn't want to get LMF stamped in, so rather uh, the kind of spirit of comradeship and a spirit of like uh, fraternity among the men ensured that the force stayed intact. I've met a lot of men who, in the years, I suppose few of them live now, <coughs> but that, that was the spirit that uh, inspired them. Harris then carried out these raids with in, in, increasing bitterness and resolution mule-like stubbornness to uh, take advice from above. You know, he, he carried out the saturation bombing raids, perfecting the method of attack and getting them better and better and killing more and more people each time he went in. Um, he went into Hamburg in July 1943. Uh, July 1943 he went in with, equipped with H2S and Oboe. Oboe doing not the target market but Oboe being used to pinpoint with target, color target indicators on the ground, the actual turning points in the route for the main bomber force to adopt, and, and also to mark the actual target area in Hamburg. And I have the maps that they used. And the, the first one, 24th of July, was aided also by an advance wave of, of planes just dropping window. Window was a code name for strips, bundles of, of strips of, of metal foil, which were dropped out of the, the plane, but 53 centimeters long, which would exactly resonate with the German radar. And it would, exactly, it would effectively blind the German radar. <coughs> Window was used. And, and it would, the, the planes would go in, and you have to experience how the perfection, how, how the, 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 the growing perfection of these raids, they must have been terrifying on the ground. I know that the British air raids were terrifying, the British air raids on, on, on Britain were terrifying for us people, but there was a disproportionality between them. In Germany, it would open, first of all, with just a, a, an unsuspecting city would suddenly find itself bathed in a dazzling white light. That's because a wave of bombers had gone in, the, the advance force of, of planes carrying just flares just the illuminators, what they were called, the illuminators. And their job was to go in and drop thousands of parachute flares over, over a target area. And they would float down very slowly from 35,000 feet to the ground under metal power canopies so that the plane itself wasn't dazzled, but illuminating the whole city like day. And the city usually <coughs> thought, well, this is it. But it might not be it because it might just be a decoy or a feint. The British became more and more refined in, in, in the feints that we use. They use radio. They use radio messages. They use all sorts of uh, electronic devices to, to carry out to, 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 to confuse the enemy. And after the illuminators and the target indicators would come in, the target indicators would be pathfinders of number eight group, dropping just loads of again not carrying any bombs or sometimes carrying a half load of bombs, but carrying loads of, of brilliant red or green or yellow target indicator flares. And they would drop target indicators to indicate approximately the target, target area to be attacked by the main force of 700 bombers. 700 bombers again. <clears throat> and then finally the, the main force would come in and would do its work in 25 or, or 30 minutes, very short space, it would be concentrated into a very short uh, a number of minutes on the city centre, go in there, incinerate the whole city and then, then withdraw. And finally, when you get to Dresden, the whole system had, been reached, uh, had reached perfection. Um, people on, on the ground in Dresden, they told me what it was like. In fact, Heinrich Himmler, he sends a code message, which Enigma, we decoded from the police chief saying, Heinrich Himmler saying he's been the subject of a terrible terror attack tonight. The first attack began at five past ten and ended at 20, 25 past ten. And hundreds of thousands of incendiary bombs and high explosive bombs have been dropped over the city centre of Dresden. The city must be described, it must be regarded as totally ruined. And, uh, and 500,000 people have lost their homes. 500,000, half a million people have lost their homes in this one raid. <clears throat> Depth of winter, very cold winter. And, 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 
Himmler was then actually tell Obama Harris. He, he said uh, Himmler would then contact uh, this police chief in, in Dresden and say, "My dear chap." My dear Alvin Slavin, every air raid, this is the actual, the actual wording he used, every air raid appears to be the, if the worst thing possible the first time it happens on the city. You know, put yourself together, man, and I'm going to send a particularly good SS officer who will stand at your elbow and get things, uh, uh, and help you to straighten things out. So that's what Himmler's response to the air raid was. So the first air raid on Dresden happened at five past nine. And uh, what happened was 275 planes of number five group went in, number five bomber group. I, I knew the commander in chief of bomber group, number five, it was, it was Air, Air, Air Marshal Cochrane. He lives in Yorkshire, and I went up there to talk to him about this. And I got a Yes, Tom Harris, Air Marshal Cochrane. You see, number, number five group. Number five group was in rivals with the number eight group, Pathfinder Force. There was a certain amount of, they were called the Lincolnshire Poachers. And they, they had their own Pathfinder Force made of mosquitoes. The mosquitoes would go in guided by radar, guided by oboe, guided by H2S. They'd all have all the best equipment. I spoke to the Air Commodore, the, 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 the RAF officer who was in charge of the RAF air raid on Dresden. Uh, he, had, he was the master bomber of Dresden. He was given, he's called the master bomber. The master bomber was a man called Wing Commander Maurice Smith. I knew him. <clears throat> he was a very handsome, elegant, upright English officer wearing a pinstripe suit. He was the chief editor of Flight International magazine, in fact. Flight International. And I went to interview him in his office in the south of London. <clears throat> and I showed him photographs of what I said, you, did, you, did you know what you'd actually done during the air raid on Dresden? Uh, I've got photographs like these in colour taken by a local photographer in Dresden, Walter Hahn, who was given a police pass to go back through the cordons and take photographs of the mass cremation of uh, 500 bodies at a time. Uh, and Maurice Smith, he, he was decent enough, he went slightly pink when he saw the photographs. He said, well, well no, in fact his job was highly professional, working, flying his master bomber duty as a master bomber on that particular raid. And, he would fly around, figure out the duration of the air raid at a height of only a thousand feet above Dresden, just radioing to the oncoming bomber stream. Hello, play for Air Force, this is the master bomber now speaking to you. Uh, ignore the green TIs, ignore the red TIs, just aim at, uh, aim, aim as from the yellow TIs, which have been properly placed. And he would go on broadcasting instructions like that to the oncoming main force throughout the attack. I also knew the master, the master one was the chief assistant in this raid, number five group again. He was another mosquito pilot. He was called the marker leader, marker leader. I told the people down in Plymouth yesterday, this is one of your people from, from Camborne. Oh, a local, their ears pricked up. He was actually William Topper and he, he flew the flight. He flew the, the marker leader. His, his mosquito was equipped with a, a special camera. And the special camera took four photographs uh, as it flew over the marking point, and his job was to fly down, mark the actual marking point with one yellow target indicator bomb, and then he was to get out, get the hell out of it, back to England. And here he took these these five photographs of Dresden. Uh, you can see there's the first photograph. There's, you can actually see the mark of the mark. The target indicator bomb is is indicated in the first picture, just about to fall out of the plane or falling out of the plane, and the next the next one shows the actual aiming point. It's it's a, a railroad a, a cycle track, a cycle track. You can see the kind of characteristic cycle track. You can actually see it on the marking on the target map too. You can see the little the little dots there, which is actually up in the plane. It, it, you see the bomb falling 50 or 60 feet below the plane already. And the next shot of that is again taken by the plane five seconds later. And then the final shot, there's a railway locomotive with the Red Cross and, and so on. You can see these things. The, the, the aiming pointed mark was a cycle track in the centre of Dresden. And you look at it now and it's not damaged. Why was that? Well, the, the actual a, a master bomber, William, his name was uh, Maurice Smith. 
it actually marked on a target map. This is the target map for Dresden. No, nobody else has it. None of the O-level historians like Ian Kershaw or, or the rest, or Richard Overy. I have this from, from because I speak to the people. You can see that there's the target. The aiming point is, the marking point is just, uh, you, you think, well, a marking point, we know what that is. That's the bullseye and the, in the dartboard and they've got it in there, smack at it. No, that wasn't the, the, the job. The, the five group had a different technique. They would fly over the aiming point in exact number of seconds. Five, six, 12, 13, whatever, until 25. And would, each plane would have a different heading. So they would fan out over that aiming point over the whole city centre. And you hear these clever historians now who say, well, of course, the Germans had a kind of them. They were guilty of the Holocaust, and they, had, they were dropping, a, they had a huge munitions factories in Dresden, and they had the important railway bridges and the railway station, and the optical factories and all that. If you look at the map, you'll see there isn't a single factory or railway bridge or anything in that centre area which is to be born, it incinerated. It is to be wiped out. And that, I know that from the people on the ground. The whole city centre was, caught, set, it was set on fire, and it was set on fire in such a way that it creates a firestorm. Everything on the outside side is sucked into the centre and goes up in the funnel, and it's a terrifying event of the hurricane winds of 100 or 200 miles an hour, and you can't survive in, in that kind of temperature or those kind of conditions, and, and many, many tens of thousands were dying in those 10 minutes. Did they know that? Only gradually did the realization then dawn on the British that this was the result. Same with the atomic bomb. They didn't realize there was radiation as a, as a my effect. But now comes the worst part. Uh, for the next 10 or 20 minutes, rescue forces from all over Germany pour into Dresden. Police, fire brigade, uh, engineer fire brigade units, all specialist units come thundering across the roads from Leipzig, from Cottbus, from Breslau, and, and, and pour into Dresden and try to rescue who they can. And then comes the second raid, right in the middle of this. I said to Bomber Harris, why do you carry out the raid on Dresden in two, in two parts? And he said, that way we caught the rescue troops too. We, it was it's the, the, the best way of killing people. You're killing them and you're killing their, their rescuers too. So Bomber Harris had, had really got perfection. He had achieved absolute perfection in this air raid, which was February the 13th, 1945. And you wonder how many people were, were killed. Hans Voigt, who was a local school teacher, <coughs> a senior school teacher, he lost his school then, he lost all his pupils that night. And he, had, uh, he was out of work and the city contacted him and said, we, we have a job for you, we will put you in charge of, of calculating the number of dead <coughs> from, from the terror air, air raid on Dresden. And his um, result was comp compiled in the form of two card indexes. Uh, he worked on that in, w until two days before the end of the war when the Russians marched into Dresden. That's how long it took the Russians to come. They arrived two days before the end of World War II. And the Russians then stopped his work on that. I said, do you know approximately how many people were killed in the air raid, what you're working on? He said, well, yes. He said, uh, he kept a diary. And he, he said that in, the, in his diary, he said he wrote that approximately 135,000 people, 135,000 people were killed. And I mention that because, of course, uh, Mr. Justice Gray in the, in the High Court, he thought this kind of thing was ob obvious evidence of Mr. Irving's lying, uh, that he had uh, invented these figures. They were it, it, it cooked up by, by these spurious uh, kind of um, chaps. I've got some of the actual intercepts. Which, which, then, which bears, this, bears this out, I'll find it in a minute. But the, the um, police chief of Dresden then, then contacted the Berlin authorities. And the day he did that, I can tell you, it's May the 24th, March 24th, 1945. On March the 24th, 1945, the police chief of Dresden contacted Berlin and he said, I had a conversation today with uh, the mayor of Dresden, the Lord Mayor of Dresden. He has erected uh, one central registry of missing people and nine subsidiary registries, nine local registries. And as of today, the number of, of those listed as registered as missing 
is 90 to 80 to 100,000 missing. And I mention that because that is actually a nice way of saying 80 to 100,000 dead have been registered today. To be registered as missing, you had to have somebody who registers you as missing. And in Dresden, at that, on that night, there were half a million refugees camped <coughs> out in the streets. There was not a bit enough people left alive to register people as missing. Um, in fact, uh, t two weeks earlier, this police chief, he'd been questioned by the local police chief in Breslau, who said, we sent you 250 police officers that night to assist in rescue operations. You have sent five of them back. What's happened to the rest? And the answer is, unfortunately, the rest of the police officers you sent us have to be regarded as being missing. And just so you don't entertain false hopes by missing, we mean they are unidentified heaps of ashes in the city center. <clears throat> So this intercepted telegram of, of March 24th, 1945, and I emphasize the date, uh, is uh, clear proof <coughs> that the death roll was by the mayor of Dresden at that time considered to be over 100,000. And I'm the one who's called a liar by the British judge going by the evidence of lawyers who weren't even born at that time and who, who got their O-levels and who know how to write conformist history. In fact, there is a German historian, historical commission of historians who've set about uh, looking at these figures, these death rolls, and, and uh, they come to the conclusion that the, the figure is grossly inflated by that man, Irving. I wasn't invited to testify as a commission. <clears throat> the real figure is much, much smaller. In fact, it's only one, only 10,000 people were killed, or only 25,000 people were killed by the RAF that night. <clears throat> no, we know what, what is the cause now of Churchill writing that memorandum. It is that intercept, giving the figure of death. 24th of March is the date of the intercept uh, that we decoded. And on the 28th of March, Churchill writes to the chiefs of her staff saying, a serious query has arisen over the conduct of a bombing. Uh, the destruction of Dresden remains a serious query on the conduct of, of bomb command. <laughs> And Bomber Command, until uh, the end of the war, was then out of favor. Until the end of the war, uh, it, it subsided. Harris had done his job. He'd been given lists of cities that had been bombed, lists of cities that had not been bombed, and had to be eliminated somehow. Dresden, Cottbus, Leipzig, and the rest had not been sufficiently bombed. They had to, be, had to be wiped out, and they were wiped out. And when it was done, then Churchill wrote that mem memorandum. And at the same time, the f foreign newspapers, the neutral newspapers, are also beginning to report on the, the chaos. And for the first time, we, we sent a, an airplane over, over Dresden to take, take the air photographs of Dresden. I've got them here. There's the air photograph of Dresden. If you look at that photograph, it's showing the bomb damage taken by a mosquito plane on March the 24th, 1945. We see you looking straight down the basement. Of every single house in that photograph has been totally burned out during the night. So the fact remains that we did not, I mean, the bombing of Hamburg left this. 48,000 people dead, just strewn across the city centre. That's a photograph taken there by a local photographer called Eric Andres. 48,000 dead were strewn across Hamburg. 12,000 people were killed in, in Darmstadt in September 1944. In Brunswick, 11,000 people. In Castle, 22,000 people were killed in a firestorm. Uh, these huge numbers of, of, of the dead, they were reported to Churchill. And when the war was over, he, he acted as though they hadn't happened. He, Victor Gollings went and visited him once, and he, Victor Gollings talked to him about Hamburg, and Churchill said, oh, I don't believe these figures. Uh, did we do that? No, I don't think so. Churchill already was getting very gaga. Um, and it all leads me to, to one conclusion, which I'll say in conclusion, and this is that occasionally our, our, our royal family would go and lay a wreath on the monument to the, un, 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 the unknown soldier. To my knowledge, there's no monument to an unknown civilian. That's what needs to be erected in every capital of the world. Wikipedia, Wikipedia claims that David Irving is not a historian. 
Well, I disagree. And don't we all disagree as well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.